Hi everybody, welcome back to Philosophy Media. In this video, I'll be installing Debian 12 Bookworm using the manual partitioning method. In this example, I'll be using MBR, the master boot record, but I'll also explain the same steps for UEFI. As there is really only a couple small differences between the two during the install, the plan is just to cover both in one video. Uh, so whichever one or method that you use to boot into the install with, you should be able to follow along with any issues whatsoever. Uh, as I'll make sure to describe any additional uh, steps that may arise along the way. So today I'll be creating six different partitions. I'll switch those now. The first one will be boot, the second root, third swap, fourth home, fifth for virtual machines, and lastly we have recovery for all the system snapshots. Uh, one of the differences between master boot record and UEFI is that you'll only be able to create four primary partitions using the master boot record. Um, after which the remaining ones will just need to be logical. And seeing as we'll be creating six today, the fourth partition and the ones fo uh, following that will all be logical. Um, other than that, pretty much the only difference is where to put the bootable flag. So with MBR, root has it. And with UEFI, um, that goes to the EFI boot partition, uh, which you'll see here in a couple minutes. Uh, I also know a lot of people out there that would like a separate home partition for their home or separate partition for their home. So I'll also go over how to preserve that from your last install. If that was the route that you wanted to take, uh, instead of just copying everything over, say, from a backup. And with all that being said, maybe I'll just switch over to a virtual machine and we can get started with the install. And as you can see, I have a Debian installer all ready to go. So I'll just uh, scroll down here to where it says start installer and hit enter. Um, a little thing that I'm noticing that's different from the previous installer is it doesn't have an option for the graphical install. So whether it's just lumping both installers into one, which would be a little bit unfortunate because then uh, we'd miss in the text-based installer. But uh, if I hit enter on this, yeah, it just opens up as to what looks like the old graphical installer. But no problem because it'll definitely work for what we're doing today. So I'm just going to select the English for language and then United States for location, uh, American English for the keyboard. Just let, give it a couple minutes to get everything ready for us. Maybe configure the network. Good old DHCP. And it's time for us for, to enter in some information here. And start with the host name. So I think I'm just going to call this box Debian. And just going to hit enter to skip the domain name. I don't really need one of those. And I'm just going to do the same with the root user. Um, if you don't create the root user here, and we create our normal user afterwards, or after this step, our normal user will just get the pseudo privileges and leave the root account disabled. Um, I guess it's a bit of a, uh, a security enhancement doing it this way. I'm not really a big fan of it, but uh, it definitely seems to work. And that's just, uh, yeah, what I'm gonna go with today. So I'm just getting an enter to skip this and then just put in the uh, full name or user. And I'll use Flossman for, for my username. And then uh, password. And then pick your time zone. And here we have the partitioner. So normally with the default, they would just go with the first option here, uh, guide, use the entire disk. But today we're gonna go and uh, do things the hard way and scroll down, select manual. And here's the volume that I want to use. But you can see I have a bunch of stuff already in here. Um, instead of going through each one and deleting uh, each partition, I'm just going to select the main volume here. And then it'll ask me if I want to create a new partition table. And I'll select yes. And that will just wipe everything out for us. So we can just start off nice and clean. And for the first partition, all we got to do is select the free space. And then after that, we just select continue. 
And the first one, of course, will be the boot partition. So I'll just create a new partition. And this one will just be uh, one gigabyte. Because I know uh, for UEFI, you need an absolute minimum of something like 536 megabytes or something like that. Uh, so I just always make my boot partitions one gigabyte. So that way I just, I know I'm safe no matter uh, which one I'm using. So let's get another and use primary and beginning. Uh, the file system will definitely have to change though. Right now it's ext4 and we'll want to change this to ext2. And the main re reason for this is because ext2 doesn't use journaling and we just don't need journaling in the boot partition. So I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I'll leave it out there and use ext2. And yep, next is set uh, as far as formatting goes. I think I'm just going to format this anyways and just wipe it all out. And this is the one setting though that you will want to uh, keep in mind when you're going to set up your home partition. If you do want to preserve that from your last install, you would definitely want to uh, select the, this option right here and keep it as no. So that way you'll be able to keep the existing data that is on that partition. But for me right now, we're on the boot partition. I'm not overly worried about it. I'm just going to uh, format it and wipe it out. And we're not on root, so I'm just gonna hit enter on that and select boot. If you're using UFI, there would be a partition down here somewhere that says EFI. That's the one you pick. But for today, we're using MBR. So we're just gonna go with this guy up here, boot. Uh, mount options, you can just leave a default uh, label I'm gonna change to boot. Uh, that's just really handy for when we say open up a program later on like uh, time shift. Um, that way we'll be able to identify each partition by its label. And reserve blocks is good at 5%. Standard uses is good. And the bootable flag, this may look a little funny, but I'm just gonna leave that as off, uh, which does look strange for a boot partition. And the reason for that is because because we're going to have to make the root partition bootable and we can't have two partitions on the same drive that are both bootable. So it does look a little strange, I know, but I just trust me, it'll work out. And yeah, all oh, that looks good to me. So I'm just gonna scroll down here to where it says done setting up partition and hit enter. And that's our, that's our boot partition. So next we have our root. So I'll just select free space, create new partition. And my root, I think I'm just gonna make 20 gigabytes. You're definitely gonna to wanna to make this a lot bigger uh, if you're installing this on hardware. Um, I would suggest doing anything under 100 as this, uh, this partition seems to grow in size fairly quick, especially if you're going to be having all your log files and stuff in there. Uh, you'll be surprised how fast it uh, creeps up on you. So yeah, definitely use a much larger number that I'm using here. So I'm just gonna enter and then make it primary and enter and enter again for the beginning. Uh, let's see, your ext4 is just fine for root. And I am just going to format it. Mount points are already at root. And uh, mount options we can leave alone. Label I'm going to change to root. Sir blocks is fine. Same thing with typical usage. So really the only areas we're concerned about are the file types, the uh, mount points, the labels, and the bootable flag. Uh, the rest we can just always leave at default. Um, except for the uh, the format, uh, when we get to the home partition, that'll be a bit different. But I'll explain that when we get to it. But for now, everything looks good. So I'm just going to select on setting up partition and continue. And oh, we did one thing around there. I'm going to go back in there and set the bootable flag for the root partition to on. If I didn't do that, the system just wouldn't have booted. But yeah, just take note of that uh, big capital B there, uh, right beside the boot partition, just to indicate that it has the, or sorry, the root partition, just to indicate that it has the bootable flag. And then next up we have swap. So I'll just select the free space, create a new partition. And I think for the swap, I'm just gonna make this eight gigabytes. Probably don't even need it, but just doesn't feel right leaving it out altogether. So yeah, I'm just gonna enter, use that. And we'll also make this primary. And at the beginning, 
And as far as file system goes, you can just hit around on this and then just select swap area, hit enter. And then that'll just auto fill everything else for you. So that's really the only field that you need to worry about on swap. And then done setting up partition. So now that we have our three primary partitions, the remaining ones after this will ha all have to be logical. Um, if we were setting this up with UEFI, we would just go ahead and make them all primary. But because we're using master boot record, we can, we can only have four primaries max. Um, we wouldn't be able to have any more of that because we'd have to make the last one as log our last one is logical before we can add any more of that. So that's why we only have three primaries here and the rest will be logical. But yeah, just once again, if this was UEFI, all these would just be primary. But yeah, and that's the main difference. So now that we're done with swap, um, we can move on with home. So I'm just going to select the free space, create a new partition. And then for the home partition, I maybe I'll just give this uh, 20 gigabytes. This is another one of those uh, partitions. You're obviously going to want to make a lot bigger, but I only have about 100 gigabytes in total on this machine to deal with. So that's why I'm just using such small values. But I think this will be just big enough to uh, to run what I want it to be able to do uh, once we get up and up and running. So let's hit enter. And then on, unlike the other ones, we're going to make this one logical at the beginning. And then this will be our home. So ext4 is good. Yeah, I'll, I'll format it. Um, but again, for sure, if uh, you wanted to say preserve your home partition from your last install, just make sure that uh, this guy right here, you hit enter on it. And then it says no keep existing data. And then you just finish up with the install and it would leave that partition as is. Um, you would, however, have to still, of course, install all your programs and all that, but all your configuration files and settings and all that stuff would still be the same. And yeah, for, for us today, I'm just going to uh, leave that as yes, so I can just wipe it out. And then we're mount points already at home. I'll just give it a uh, label here and call it home. And then typical usage is good. Brutal flags already off. So let's select on setting up partition. And then up after that, we have the virtual machines. So let's select the free space and create a new partition. And for virtual machines, actually, I think I'll give this uh, 30 gigabytes because that should be just enough for like one virtual machine. <laughs> and I'll hit enter at the beginning. And yeah, it can stay uh, ext4. And yeah, I guess I'll format it, just wipe it out. Um, mount point, don't want it to be USR though. So we'll have to change that. And if the thing that you want to change it to is in the list here, you can just go down to the bottom, select enter manually and enter here. So, and don't forget about this forward slash right here. So it'll indicate that it's in, from the root directory. And I'm just going to call this root machines like so. And that'll be good as ext4. Yeah, I might as well format it. Uh, mount points good as we just set it. And the label, I'm going to change this to vert machines. And then scroll down and select on setting up partition uh, because all that stuff looks good. And then we got one more left, and that would be for recovery. So I'm just going to select the free space creating partition. And because we're going to be using the rest of the drive, I'm just going to type in max, hit enter. ext4 is good. Uh, yeah, format it, sure. Uh, mount point will change though from USR and do the exact same thing that we just did with the virtual machines, uh, except this time we'll be doing with recovery. So enter manually. Uh, don't forget the forward slash, then recovery. And ext4 will be good. Yep, might as well format it. Uh, label, I'm going to change that to recovery. And all this stuff can stay the same. And just scroll down to done setting up partition and enter. And that's pretty much it. Uh, that's all our partitions. So we got our boot, root, swap, home, virtual machines, recovery. Our first three partitions here are primary. The last three are logical, which looks good. Bootable flags already on root which is what we want. 
And just uh, one last time, if you're not completely sick of me saying this, if you are doing this with UEFI, um, all these uh, predictions right here will all be primary. So, yeah, the only reason I'm using logical here is because I'm using MBR. But, uh, yeah, so the, just the main two differences are, are the types of the drive or types of the uh, uh, partition. If this is UEFI, these would all be primary uh, because it's MBR. We have half of them as logical. And the bootable flag is uh, located at root. Whereas if it was UEFI, the bootable flag would be on boot and that boot would be named EFI. So yeah, sort of I keep repeating myself. I just want to make absolute sure I don't forget to uh, mention any of this stuff uh, because it can trip you up quite a bit if you forget one of these little details. But I think we're good. One thing that does look a little strange is the way it counts. Like it goes one, two, three, five, six, seven. Um, I find it usually does that when I use logical volumes. It kind of messes up the numbers a bit. Or it'll create the number four one and it's just say like a one megabyte uh, storage or something. But uh, yeah, none of that even matters. I just thought I'd mention it in case it looked a little funny to you. But yeah, now that all looks good, I'm just going to uh, select uh, finish partitioning and write changes to disk. And then we can have another quick check right here. So ext2 is our boot partition, which is what it should be. ext4 was the root. And then we have the swap. And then after that, we have our home, which is ext4. Uh, after that, we have our virtual machines and then our recovery partition. So everything looks good. So I think I'm gonna do now is just select yes and write changes to disk. And this may take some time. I'm guessing about five or 10 minutes. So I think what I'm gonna do maybe is just pause the video and uh, come back when it's almost done. So yeah, I'll uh, see you in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we're almost done with the main part of the install. Yeah, now it's asking if you want to install a network mirror and I'm definitely gonna go with yes for that. I'll just click continue. And United States, uh, dev.debian.org will work. I usually find that to be pretty quick. Uh, I'm just gonna skip the proxy and continue. And like configure the package manager. And I think grub is after this. And then we should be almost at the finish line. This uh, installer used to ask if, if you uh, want to install it at the end. Actually, maybe it still does. But uh, yeah, you'd always be in a bit of a pickle if you forgot to do that. And then you tried to boot in your system afterwards. It was uh, a never a good time, but uh, not the case anymore. As, uh, yeah, it's already selected yes for us. So all we have to do is install it. You just you know, or click on continue and then select your, uh, your volume. So for me, I want to install it on VDA1. Um, and most likely for you, if you're installing this on hardware, uh, this will say SDA instead of VDA, but uh, that'll be the one you want. So I'm just gonna click on continue. And every time I say I'm about to pause the video, it progresses a bit. So maybe I'll just sit back and wait. Yeah, but seeing as my uh, small talk skills aren't that great, uh, maybe I'll just hit this one out, take a break and pause the video. So I'll be back in a couple minutes. And it looks like the installation is complete. So all we got to do now is click continue and we'll boot it in the new system. And yeah, as soon as you do this, you may want to get your hand on your USB and get ready to pull it out. If you install this on hardware, um, it used to be after you clicked on this button, the progression bar would progress to a certain point and then it would stop. And then right after it started again, that's when you pull out your, get ready to pull out the USB. But this installer, that's a little bit different. 
So after you do click this button, it's only going to be a few seconds before um, you'll have to pull out your USB. So I'll just be ready as soon as you click this. And I'll do that now. And I get ready to pull out your USB right about now. So not a whole lot of time there. I'll make this full screen again. So I think with this boots up, all I'll do is maybe fix the resolution and then just open up a terminal and check out our partitions and see their, uh, see the way they look. Hopefully they'll look the way they should. And then I think with all the post install stuff, I'll maybe just cover that on a, uh, on a separate video, such as the initial update and setting up time shift and all that stuff. And here we go with the login. Well, so far so good. So let's click on that guy and then this one down here. And I just like to make sure I'm running Exorg or X11 instead of uh, Wayland. Uh, Wayland's the default option up here when you pick GNOME. So that's why I always go with Exorg down here at the bottom. And there we go. And then just type in your password. And here we go. Well, it opens up in the activities uh, menu. I'm not quite sure. It's a little strange. You think it would just go right in the desktop. But I saw that on a uh, previous release too. So I figured it was something on my end, but I guess not. So I'll just click on that to open it up. And then next. And we already did this stuff, but let's just do it again. And get rid of that. And definitely skip that. And now we're done. So I'll start using uh, GNU slash Linux. One thing I always liked about Debian too is how they keep that GNU slash in there for the Linux. That's always really nice to see. So I think what I'll do now maybe is just uh, change this resolution quick. So open up settings. And then just go into display, wherever that would be, right there. And then change the resolution to this guy right here. And then apply. Yeah, that looks a lot better. Keep the changes. And now we can get rid of this. And now what we need is a terminal. Which is right there. And I'll make this bit bigger. And So yeah, instead of running the updates and all that stuff right now, I think what I'm going to do is just run LSBLK and see what our partitions look like. So here we have our boot, which we gave about one gigabyte. So that looks good. And then our root partition, which I only gave 20 gigabytes. And that looks good. Uh, swap looks good. I gave it eight. And there's this four I was talking about earlier. So yeah, I guess it just throws in a little bit of space uh, somewhere in the middle there. I guess I'm not sure why it's right there, but uh, that's where it went. But at least it doesn't look like it's going to be hurting anything. So, But then after that, we have our home. And I gave that 20 gigs, so that looks good. Uh, same with virtual machines and recovery. Um, just a couple quick notes. Uh, when you do go to install your virtual machines, if that's what you, uh, you're you doing like me, I just make sure that they go in this folder right here, of course. Um, and then when you set up uh, Vert Manager, whatever software application you're going to use, I just make sure that it's pointing to this directory right here. And uh, that way you'll be able to keep all that stuff also separate from your system on its own partition. And same thing too, of course, with the recovery. Uh, when you go to set up time shift, I just make absolutely sure that uh, your recovery directory, or uh, I'm forgetting the technical name for it, um, the spot where time shift looks for its uh, recovery snapshots, make sure it's pointing at this directory right here. So forward slash recovery. Um, all I want to do now maybe is just see how much the, uh, the root partition used um, after it uh, started up and did all its things. So which would be just df slash h. And there's the root partition right there. And it used 7.8 gigs, which isn't bad at all. I find normally with a fresh install, I, 
with uh, uh, Debian with the GNOME desktop, I get about between our 11 and 12 gigs. So uh, hopefully that's a little bit lighter for a, a good reason. <laughs> And not just because they took a bunch of stuff out, but uh, yeah, it's definitely nice to see stuff a little bit lighter. And as far as the percentages and stuff go, you don't really have to worry about those. Those uh, yours will look completely different. Uh, mine just looks so wonky because I use such small numbers to get everything to fit on the virtual machine. Yeah, everything looks good here though. I think uh, we're off to in the uh, right direction. So as far as um, creating or installing uh, Debian with uh, manual partitions. Uh, I think that's a good way to go about it. So we covered both UE, UEFI and MBR. Um, again, the main differences with um, MBR is that you can only create um, four primary primary partitions on Max. If you create more than that, like say six or seven, like we did today, the actually the fourth one will also have to be logical, as well as the, all the following ones. Um, if you're installing with UEFI, you can make absolutely all the partitions primary and you won't have any issues. And the one big other difference is the bootable flag. So with UEFI, the bootable flag will go with root, or sorry, with um, with MBR and master boot record, the bootable flag will go with root like we did today. Um, but if you're installing with uh, UEFI, the bootable flag will go with the EFI boot partition. So, yeah, just a couple of things to keep in mind if uh, that's what you're going to be doing on your next install. Yeah, I think that about does it for today, though. If you guys had any problems during this install, uh, please just let me know down in the comments, and I'm sure we'll eventually get it figured out. I'm also working on a post-install script, like I previously mentioned, and I'm still in the process of fine-tuning it. But when it is finished, I'll make sure I upload it um, following this video. And then that way you'll be able to uh, quickly configure and uh, install the applications on the system the way you want in a way that's completely automated and uh, just uh, far easier for you to carry out if you have other stuff to do and you don't want to be sitting at your machine all day. Yeah, and then if a disaster happens to strike, you can uh, just build your system up again from scratch in practically no time at all, uh, as long as you have a uh, a post-install script that's usually maintained as you use your system. So as you add more applications and functions uh, to your system, you just want to also add them to these scripts as well. And uh, a lot of times this will just be in uh, text form, uh, giving, say, the system a list of all everything you want installed and all the directories you want moved and all that. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to making that video. And uh, we'll go through that certainly in the next one. But uh, yeah, I hope this was a help. And bye for now.